Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the APSC Cloud Forum of Cardiovascular Disease. Shall we start? Shall we start? Yes. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the APSC Cloud Forum of Cardiovascular Diseases Series. The forum today focuses on the Adult Congenital Heart Disease 2022 update. With medical advances, the Adult Congenital Heart Disease HHD patient will grow not only in population size, but also in the mental complexity. The estimates for the prevalence of HHD were within the range of two to six per thousand adults in countries with established HHD programs. This webinar for the entitled Adult Congenital Heart Disease 2022 update is to provide an overview on the innovative strategic care for the HHD patient. After the webinar follow, the participant shall be familiar with the recent advances in the complex medical issues in HHD, including arrhythmia, heart failure, pregnancy and labor, transcatheter intervention, and the transitional care. And we have speaker, five speakers to cover the whole scope. I'm Mei Wan Wu from National Taiwan University Children's Hospital in Taipei. I'm honored to co-chair with Dr. Teji Akagi. Dr. Akagi is currently the president of Japanese Society for Adult Congenital Heart Disease and also the head of Cardiac Intensive Care Unit and the director of Adult Congenital Heart Disease Center in Okayama University Hospital. And the disclaimer from APSC is summarized as following. The content of this webinar is copyright and should not be distributed without the permission. The view and opinion is placed are those of the faculty members. And live streaming content of this webinar will be made available via APSC Cloud, APSC Facebook, and YouTube page. Let's get started. The first talk is arrhythmia in HHD. It's our honor to invite Dr. Jae Yong Yoon from Korea to deliver the talk. Dr. Yoon is an outstanding pediatric electrophysiologist. He's currently the staff in Division of Cardiology, Sengshong General Hospital. Please join me to welcome Dr. Yoon. Thank you for having me. Um, I will start my presentation. Can you see my slide? Yes, very, very well. well. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction. First of all, I would like to appreciate that I have the privilege to present this lecture. I'm Cha Kyung Yoon from Sejong General Hospital in South Korea. I'm gonna talk about arrhythmia in adult congenital disease. I will briefly explain the background of why we are here to talk about adult congenital disease. This is a nice graph from England that we can see the trends in in the percentage of all CHD related deaths over time. The number of infants who didn't survive have been decreasing as the cardiopulmonary bypass and surgical technique have improved. Recently, you can see the burdens of ACHD patients have increased. So we are faced with new problem of ACHD. In North America and Europe, there is more than 3 million ACHD patients and they outnumbered kids almost two to one. This population is rapidly expanding. That means progressive increase in ACHD admissions and increasing healthcare resource utilization for this patient. 
we have to focus on take care of this patient in this regard. So why are arrhythmia important in HHD patient? From a rhythm perspective, there are many separated issue, but today I will uh, cover two essential issues, including atrial arrhythmia and ventricular arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death. This is a Canadian study looking at their HHD population. Overall, uh, the 20 year risk of atrial arrhythmia was 7% in a 20 year old patient. However, the risk increased to 38% in a 55 year old patient. And looking at uh, the cumulative incidence of atrial arrhythmia, almost half of the patient at the mid 60 have identified identified atrial arrhythmia. This incidence of atrial arrhythmia is different and it's depending on the congenital disease anomaly. The more complex anomaly and more atrial scar burden, for example, in the patient undergoing atrial switch operation or fontan operation, ultimately end up with significant atrial arrhythmia combined. HCHD patient with atrial arrhythmia present a significantly increased risk of adverse events and mortality. And also these patients are prone to more heart failure and probably a stroke. For this reason, we should be aware of atrial arrhythmia in HCHD patient and more aggressively treat it. So why are the patients with HCHD uh, so prone to atrial arrhythmia? This picture is the way we explain how atrial arrhythmia developed from an EP perspective. Among these, CHD patients have more arrhythmia substrate than non-congenital disease patients. These substrates include congenital heart defect itself, surgical scar, hemodynamic loading, which results in myocardial damage and atrial enlargement, and also hypoxia. As you know, reentry is the most important mechanism of arrhythmia in HCHD. Typical atrial plateau rotates around the tricuspid annulus using the crystal terminalis as the boundary. Carbo tricuspid isthmus is a slow conduction zone and the target of ablation. CHD patients have got many other important substrate, as I told you, we can notice a plateau circuit around the patch and also find out the circuit formed around surgical suture line. HCHD patients with atrial arrhythmia are highly symptomatic and often poorly tolerated. And the thromboembolic risk in complex congenital disease patient is higher than in other patients. So for this patient, we should manage it arrhythmias promptly. Atrial arrhythmia in CHD is not so fast. So sometimes they do not have a palpitation symptom. In this ECG, in some lead, it may be so easier to see plateau rhythm, but in some of them, it's not so easy. Sometimes it's hard to recognize because the intra-atrial re-entral tachycardia could masquerade at sinus rhythm. But so you you can see the uh, baseline plateau rhythm if you check the halter or use intravenous adenosine. So how do you manage this atrial arrhythmia in HCHD patient? As first, we have to identify and treat precipitation factors. In adult congenital heart disease, it's difficult to rate control and many patients have a slow atrial arrhythmia. So we are almost moving to a rhythm control strategy. First, we can consider pharmacologic therapy. Because of lack of data, pharmacologic therapy is extrapolated from guiding principles established in non-congenital disease. Especially in CHD, uh, the arrhythmia mechanism is usually the entry. So class three antiarrhythmic drug is a drug of choice, like amiodarone and sotarone. And in case of simple congenital disease like ASD and normal ventricular function, we can use class one antiarrhythmic drugs. When we prescribe the antiarrhythmic drug for ACHD patient, considerations include the degree of uh, systemic ventricular dysfunction and sinus node disease and impaired AV nodal uh, conduction uh, disease. 
and it can show a higher recurrence of arrhythmia. And sometimes in long-term use, the patient may experience an adverse effect. Sometimes we have no choice of drug. Because medical therapy has traditionally limited success, catheter ovulation is emerging as a promising alternative option for this patient. 36-year-old patient with ASD, MPS, and status post-ASD closure at 8 years old was presented for severe TR and PR. She underwent pulmonary valvuloplasty and tricuspid valvuloplasty last year in our hospital. In the early post-operative period, arrhythmia de was developed. This ECG shows intraatrial enteral tachycardia with heart rate 103. It's relatively slow tachycardia. During follow-up, her tachycardia frequently recurred and was highly symptomatic, and after the termination of tachycardia, a significant pause of up to three seconds was observed. So we decided that she should be brought to the EP lab for cassette ovulation. Using 3D mapping system, we identify uh, her tachycardia was CTI-dependent IART. In vertice map, uh, you can see her diseased atrium. This is what we call an isthmus. Um, this wave of electric activation circulating around tricuspid valve and conducted through the isthmus and back it up. So we ovulated CTI successfully and tachycardia was terminated. After termination, we got the six second sinus pause. In many cases, we can get another circuit. This 54 year old patient who underwent repair for sinus venous type ASD and PAPVR was presented with tachycardia and was brought to EP lab. She has already got CTI ovulation. This uh, red area means the raw voltage is a scar, look like an atrial incision, a surgical incision scar. You got the IART traveling around the incision scar. So we ovulated for RA free wall scar to IVC line. Tachycardia was successfully terminated. In general, the Pontan operation had saved many lives, but it's complicated by uh, arrhythmia and other Pontan failures. Pontan patients have a large atrium and multiple scars, so this patient may have multiple different forms of potential reentrant circuit. In Pontan patient with ECC conduit, for access to the pulmonary venous atrium, uh, direct conduit puncture is required. Transcapular puncture or transpulmonary puncture can be used, but still uh, it's very tough job. And we are always aware of where the intrinsic conduction system is, uh, is because we should avoid iatrogenic AV block or sinus node dysfunction. Sometimes we may encounter multiple different tachycardia during EP study. It's not easy to distinguish what clinical tachycardia is. This all thing makes cassette ovulation a challenge. So we should weight the risk and benefit before we decide uh, on cassette ovulation. Looking at the outcome of cassette ovulation, acute success rate up to 80%. However, it's not satisfying that the recurrence rate is up to 34% to 80% at more than five years of follow-up. More complex atrial anatomy like mustard or pontan was associated with higher RFCA procedure failure rate and higher recurrent rate. So in adult congenital disease patient, atrial arrhythmia could develop relatively young and more AT and flutter at presentation, but it could progress to AP rapidly and persistently. So we should treat this arrhythmia more aggressively, especially when it's an organized form like IART or AT. And there is another topic, thrombosis, actually complex uh, congenital heart disease itself is a higher thrombogenic state. Here is an ECC Pontan patient who has a long history. He was presented uh, atrial fibrillation. If hemodynamics uh, deteriorate, this cardioversion would be considered. 
However, we know that frontal circulation is prone to a thrombosis, so we cannot apply the adult guideline as it is. This PG chart showed ACHD guideline thromboprophylaxis in arrhythmia. In case of more than moderate CHD, uh, TEE or three weeks anticoagulation before cardioversion was strongly recommended regardless of arrhythmia duration. And also for long-term thromboprophylaxis in more than moderate CHD, warfarin is usually recommended so far. Although we can try catheter ablation for AFib, but the role of AFib catheter ablation is still limited. More complexity anomaly is less acute success rate and higher recurrent rate. Also, we have to consider surgical option. A combined maze procedure is reasonably effective to prevent and treat atrial arrhythmia in patients with CHD. The recurrence rate is still not low, but it can be one of the options for reducing the arrhythmia burden. So we are going to move into uh, uh, sudden cardiac death. It's a big issue for adult congenital disease. When looking at the cause of death in CHD patient, sudden cardiac death is one of the leading cause of death following heart failure. According to recent data, about a quarter of mortality in adult congenital disease is going to be sudden cardiac death. So that's the reason we have to follow up this patient carefully with risk stratification. Of them, arrhythmias account for approximately 80% of all sudden cardiac deaths in congenital disease population. Ventricular arrhythmia are most common events. Although the incidence of sudden cardiac deaths in the CHD population is relatively low, but specific subgroup of high risk include tetralogy of fallow, systemic RV ventricle, left-sided afro-obstruction lesion, and Eisenmenger syndrome. This table shows atrial arrhythmias have been noted to trigger malignant ventricular, uh, ventricular arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death in susceptible individuals with several repaired complex congenital disease. TOF is the most common CHD associated with ventricular arrhythmia. As you know, repaired TOF patients have one or two patches at the VSD and or RVOT, which provide important substrate for ventricular reentrant arrhythmia. There is a lot of published data on what will predict sudden cardiac death in TOF. But I'd like to emphasize for if patient has RV dysfunction, QRS duration more than 180 milliseconds, documented non-sustained VT, induced sustained VT at EP study, you should worry about sudden cardiac death in repaired TOF patient who have this finding. So in this high-risk patient, we should consider ICD insertion for primary prevention. As regard, PACE and ESC guideline make ICD for primary uh, prevention recommendations similar. Cassette ablation has emerged as a useful tool to reduce the episode of VT or ICD shock. However, it should not be considered a substitute for an ICD in ACHD. But the subgroup of patients with successful ablation of VT isthmuses demonstrated by directional conduction block across them and preserved ventricular function seems to be at low risk of VT recurrence and a sudden cardiac death. As technology advanced, the acute su the success rate is increased and the recurrence rate is also decreased in some selected cases. It's very encouraging. Another specific group of high risk of sudden cardiac death is patients with systemic RV. The morphologic RV is sub and prone to failure over time. Unfortunately, identifying high-risk patients in this group has been less successful than with TOF. Primary prevention with ICD may be reasonable in an adult with single ventricle or systemic RV um, EF less than 35%. 
particularly in the presence of additional risk factors. In general, ICD implantation is indicated patients with CHD with not tolerated VT or VPIP associated cardiac arrest survivor after exclusion of reversible cause. This is a secondary prevention. Currently, we have a study option for ICD. Subcutaneous ICD has been introduced recently, so it may overcome several limitations and be an attractive option, particularly for patients with whom intravenous access is not feasible. Uh, this is my take-home message. The burden of arrhythmia is increasing in ACHD. Atrial arrhythmia is more common in ACHD and are characterized a gradual transition from IART to APIP over, over the lifetime. Atrial arrhythmia is associated with mortality and morbidity in ACHD, so proof of management is essential. Ventricular tachyarrhythmia and sudden cardiac death occur more frequently among specific ACHD. For prevent prevention of sudden cardiac death, Management of VT and risk stratification for sudden cardiac death is critical. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Young, for your wonderful talk, which is very inspiring. And um, I think arrhythmia is, is also a quite unique clinical manifestation of right heart failure in HHD, and the management is completely different. Yeah. And thank you. And Let's move on to the next talk, uh, which is the which is a, a topic focused on the heart failure in HHD, and the heart failure in HHD is quite different from that in general population, and the majority is right heart failure, and sometimes it's single ventricular failure, and only really this classical left heart failure. And the talk will be delivered by Dr. Junwei Lu. Uh, Dr. Lu is currently the director of HHD Center in National Taiwan University Hospital. And he actually started the HHD care program in Taiwan in 2008 and contributed a lot to this field and help a lot of patients to overcome their problems. Please join me to welcome Dr. Lu. Thank you, Professor Wu. And today I am going to talk about uh, heart failure in ACHD. Heart failure is the leading cause of. Heart failure is the leading cause of mortality, and it is also from the German uh, National Registry we can see uh, it showed a trend of increase over time. The admission in HHD patient due to heart failure showed an uh, increase in hospital events, length of stay, and um, incidence of arrhythmia. And then in hospital mortality, then those without CHD. Because it is an important issue. Therefore, in the year 2016, both AHA and the ESC proposed a uh, site scientific statements for heart failure measurement in ACHD. There are some distinct nature of, of heart failure in ACHD, including it usually have diverse causes and the possible physiologies. These factors can all contribute to the formation development of the heart failure, uh, such as violent or pressure overload, myocardial dysfunction, human hypertension, systemic hypertension, coronary artery disease, no matter congenital or acquired, uh, cyanosis, and um, intractable arrhythmia or dyssynchrony. And some specific lesion can easily associate heart failure, including system RV, such as CCTGA or complete TGA post actual switch, single ventricle with or without fountain, Repair tetra follow with severe TR or those patients with pulmonary hypertension or abstent anomaly. Approach IS is the 
collaboration of uh, 24 centers in 15 countries around the world, um, working on the patient reported outcome for HSD patients. Uh, we recently published the uh, investigation about half value in HSD patients. Uh, we include uh, around 4,000 patients around the world. And we found the, the patient are enrolled in uh, our patient clinic. The incidence of uh, heart failure is around 11%. We noticed that um, older age and more complex CSD uh, presence of arrhythmia. Patient with ICD implantation the patient with other comorbidities or a patient with mood disorders are easily prone to develop heart failure. And we also noticed that heart failure can significantly impact the patient reported outcomes, including physical functioning, mental fun health, quality of life, satisfaction with life, uh, sense of coherence, and it can also um, where's the feeling of patient's anxiety, depression, and the illness perception. And we noticed that uh, if the patient had a more complex CHD, the incidence of heart failure is increased. Why are the depression are associated with heart failure? The possible mediating mechanism uh, to induce heart failure due to depression, including the physiological factors and the behavioral factors, such as enhanced inflammation, autonomic abnormality, platelet aggregation, or vascular endothelial dysfunction. And some behavioral factors, such as poor adhesion to physical activity, healthy diet, um, or uh, medical therapy can also uh, worse the heart failure. Then, of course, heart failure can cause um, the patient more depressed. So this is a bidirectional mediating team mechanism. Heart failure in HRT have um, distinct nature because the patient have usually have lifelong adaptation to their physiological derangement. Therefore, the typical feature of heart failure may not be present. So the diagnosis of heart failure in HJT is um, usually challenging. I noticed a, a clear definition can uh, recently be uh, published. They, they define the patient with symptom sign of heart failure requiring therapy plus one of the following criteria such as impaired ventricle function, elevated BMP, and the poor uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test. And for those patients with fountain circulation, they present with protein losing enteropathy, plastic bronchitis, with higher system venous pressure or a poor cardiac index. And this criteria is um, usually it's easier for clinical practice and uh, for research purpose. Here are the sign of symptoms of heart failure in HRD patient. Um, these are the symptoms for the deep heart failure and the sign of the deep heart failure. And uh, there are some sign and the symptom for the subquery um, ventricle failure. But in many patients with uh, of HHT, they have both, both sides heart failure. The key point in treating heart failure in HHT patients is to identify and then treat comorbidity such as DM, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, or thyroid uh, dysfunction, or anemia. Uh, the following is to recon recognize the underlying anatomy, awareness of the possibly related application for this underlying anatomy and to examine the lesion for possible intervention, uh, including hemodynamic or arrhythmia. And sometimes we need invasive hemodynamic evaluation for 
uh, defend the treat method for this patient. Unlike acquired CHD, uh, unquite heart failure, um, treating heart failure in SHD most rely on structural intervention, then following the device therapy and uh, medication for this patient um, are in the third position. Here are the example of the spatial specific anat anatomy and the um, uh, uh, common problem we should be noticed, such as tetra follow, we have to notice the presence of common regurgitation over RBOT attraction. And uh, we just talked about the high risk of VT in such patients. And uh, we should follow up for the possibility of occurrence of such complication and uh, try to avoid the sequel. Some patients also had uh, interesting myocardial dysfunction. So we may consider uh, medications for traditional treatment of heart failure. However, in patient with HSD, the, this medication usually lack of strong evidences. This, these are some um, example of uh, possible study results for treating heart failure in HAD patient. The items in yellow mark are the positive findings, such as beta blockers in uh, single right ventricle or beta blockers in sing, single ventricle and the pulmonary vasodilators for fountain circulation. And arrhythmia can both act as a cause and the consequence of impaired hemodynamic, IRT, atrial fibrillation, sinus, or abino dysfunction may trigger or exacerbate heart failure. On the other hand, the volume overload, increased feeding pressure, low cardiac output, and the hypoxemia may precipitate arrhythmia. So the identify and the management of heart in arrhythmia in heart failure patient is also very important. For the very severe, uh, disease of heart failure in HHT patient. Patient may meet all four criteria as follows, such as episodes of congestion, lower cardiac or malignant arrhythmia. Patient with severe cardiac dysfunction or exercise impairment and the persistent symptom of heart failure. If the patient uh, meets all these four criteria, the treatment and of heart failure should be more aggressive, such as we should earlier consider advanced therapy, such as uh, CRT, mechanical circulation support, or heart transplant. For CRT in HAD patient with heart failure was recommended in those with NOIHA functional class two to four symptoms with impaired system ventricular ejection function and the prolonged QRS duration. The presence of a systemic LV predicted a better CRT response for the standard system RV. Those patients with system LV convert to CRT from conventional RV pacing with the uh, best response. But in patients with single ventricle morphology, we may consider the CRT using optimum, optimal size, size of pacing. This is a, a recommendation for Horizon Society for CRT um, implementation for heart failure in HHD patient. The most recommended uh, with class one mechanism is the CTR LV with uh, LV dysfunction and QR, prolonged QRS duration. But it can also be considered uh, in CCNRV and the single ventricle patient with uh, lesser strong supporting evidences. The indication for heart transplant in HT is stage D heart failure refractory to medical therapy and the results without benefit significantly from surgical interventional or electrophysiology intervention. 
She has still associated new sudden deaths of life-threatening arrhythmia, uh, refractory to all therapeutic mortality are also considered to be transplant listing. For those with uh, pulmonary hypertension with stage three heart failure, if he are um, prone to divine fix irreversible elevated vascular disease, they can also consider listing in for heart transplant. What is the outcome of the heart transplant in HGHT patient? According to ISHLT registry, uh, because the, uh, the surgical procedure for HGHT is usually com more complex and risky. So in HGHT recipient, they have a significant lower one year and five year survival. However, it showed a survival paradox for the longer survival because the HIV patient recipient are always younger. So they have significant higher 10 year or 15 year survival. Uh, the ventricular assistance device can also uh, consider uh, as testation therapy or bridging therapy. The, however, the utilization of VSD, VAD remains low in CHG population. The VAD may consider in system RV or a single ventricle. The outcome of mechanical circulation approach in HD is usually um, poorer than those without CHD. A recently published paper from Mayo Clinic demonstrated a uh, important issue. That is for those with advanced heart failure in HSD, comparing to transplant listing, the conventional cardiac intervention showed a um, very high mortality. That, therefore, we, for patients with advanced heart failure, we may con consider transplantation listing earlier. And for those with advanced heart value, in the implementation of advanced care planning is also very important in our field. And this is our uh, my take home message. Heart value in HSD is the leading cause of mortality and it showed a trend of increase over time. It has diverse causes. and it was usually this year specific. It was associated with of the age, complex defect, comorbidity, arrhythmia, mood, and the mood disorder. Uh, presence of heart failure can also impact the quality of life. Treating heart failure in HD rely on identify and treat comorbidity, recognize the anatomy, and the awareness of the possible related complication. We should examine the region of arrhythmia and the hemodynamic derangement for correction. In patients with advanced heart failure, early consideration of advanced therapy such as transplant lesion should be performed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lu, for sharing with us uh, so many important information, including your uh, multi-center study on heart failure and a lot of uh, cytosom uh, quality of life issues. And I think it's really challenging. Thank you. And now I would like to uh, turn my podium to the, my co-chair, Dr. Teji Akagi. Okay, thank you very much. So the, we'd like to move to the next speaker. Uh, next issue is the pregnancy and delivery for the adult congenital heart disease. This is a very important area and uh, we like to say uh, request for that, say, this kind of topics, Dr. Chizuko Kamiya. She's a very important member for the, our society, especially for this field. Uh, so Dr. Kamiya, please start your lecture. Thank you, Dr. Akagi. Thank you very much for having me here. I'm very honored to present here. So let's share my screen. Oh. 
Okay, I'm going to start. I have no COI. <laughs> At first, let me introduce our hospital, National Cerebral and Cardiovascular Center, NCBC in Japan. Our center is the only national institute specified for cardiovascular disease in Japan that consists of a hospital and a research institute. The OBGY department at NCVC sees more than 100 pregnancies complicated with cardiovascular disease annually. About one third of them are complicated with congenital heart disease, CHD, and this graph shows an increasing number of those year by year. Today, I'm going to present three topics. Pregnancy and labor in women with CHD as general remarks. Then move on to postpartum concerns and contraception. After conception, maternal physiologic conditions, including cardiovascular systems, change dynamically as for increased heart rate, increased blood volume, hypercoagulability, weakened arterial wall, and so on. In normal pregnancy, enough cardiac reserve and compensatory mechanisms, such as decreasing afterload against the increased preload, lead to a normal cause of pregnancy. However, in some women with CHD, these physiological changes can cause cardiovascular complications, heart failure, arrhythmias, OB complications such as hemorrhage and hypertensive disorders may aggravate maternal condition too. Therefore, the rate of complications in pregnant women with CHD is higher than that in the normal pregnancies. The famous cohort, the HARA study, which included more than 1,300 pregnant women with CHD, showed arrhythmias in 4.8%, half failure in 1.6%, and preterm delivery 12.3%. Multivariate model indicated that history of arrhythmias, cardiac medication before pregnancy, New York heart class, left ventricular obstruction, atrial ventricular valve regurgitation, mechanical valve, and cyanotic heart disease were risk factors of maternal cardiovascular complications. Depending on maternal physiological changes, there are times when complications are more likely to occur. This is a very important point for preventing complications or diagnosing them as early as possible. During pregnancy, maternal cardiac output increases, especially in the second trimester and up to one and a half fold the pre pregnancy amount around 30 weeks of gestation. In labor, cardiac output increases more and peaks immediately after delivery because of all transfusion. After delivery, it takes about three months to return to pre-pregnancy condition. Can you see two peaks? of cardiac output, one is located around 30 weeks and another is located in the second stage of labor and immediately after delivery. This graph indicates the occurrence of heart failure in patients with structural heart disease during and after pregnancy reported by Ruiz. As you can see, the peak times of diagnosing perinatal heart failure is by model at around 30 weeks gestation and between intrapartum and soon after delivery. 
around such times, we must be more cautious when seeing perinatal women with CHD. And these are good times for cardiac exams, including echocardiogram. Here I'm showing one typical case of perinatal heart failure. Her diagnosis was TGA, and she had moderate mitral regurgitation after an arterial switch operation. She was in New York Heart Plus 2 and took diuretics before her twin pregnancy. She started to complain of dyspnea on light effort after 30 weeks of gestation. Her chest X-ray at 33 weeks showed cardiomegaly and congestion. Caesarean section was performed at 34 weeks due to fetal growth arrest. Six hours after delivery, her oxygen saturation dropped down and her pulmonary congestion became worse. IV diuretics and oxygen mask supply was started and she recovered soon after. Move to the next talk. The figure shows maternal sympathetic nerve activity in normal pregnancy, which is increasing as the gestational weeks progress. In antepartum, sympathetic nerve activity exceeds parasympathetic nerve activity. During the latter half of pregnancy, heart rate are increasing up to 1.2 fold the pre-pregnancy weight. In a Canadian cohort of pregnancies with cardiovascular disease, CARPREG2, the occurrence of prepartum arrhythmias was shown as blue bars in the graph. Many of arrhythmic events occurred in antepartum. From our experience, body arrhythmia tend to occur in postpartum. Here is a case of repair TOF and severe pulmonary regurgitation. Her pre-pregnancy RVEDVI was 168. Her QRS duration was 167 milliseconds. At her 24th week of the station, HOTA electrocardiogram was performed. During the exam, she complained of strong palpitation, which she had never felt before. Her halter showed non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. To determine the maternal pregnancy risk, the modified WHO classification is often used. This classification categorizes women with heart disease into four or five pregnancy risk classes as determined by their medical condition. The European Society of Cardiology guidelines shows the approximate percentages of maternal cardiovascular events in each classes. For example, women in class four that are not recommended to be pregnant have 40 to 100% of peripartum cardiac event risks. Women in class three and four need special preconception counseling by expert. When they become pregnant, expert hospitals are recommended to manage such high-risk pregnancies. Now I'd like to talk about labor. Women with CHD have a rising rate of preterm deliveries. At our hospital, the rate was 13.8%. Remarkably, most of them were decided due to obstetrical reasons. Many doctors have asked me whether vaginal delivery or cesarean section is better for women with severe heart disease. In vaginal delivery, Less amount of anesthetics is needed than C-section. C-section tend to cause more bleeding, need longer bed rest, 
and have higher incidence of thrombosis. So, vaginal delivery should be the first choice in women with most CHD, in most women with CHD. However, in the second stage of labor, mother needs straining and pushing. Therefore, we choose C-section as the first choice in women with malfunction syndrome whose aorta is significantly dilated or with acute congestive heart failure. We monitored maternal hemodynamic parameters in normal pregnancies by using an electrical cardiometry monitor. Compared to C-section and vaginal delivery without anesthesia, vaginal delivery with epidural anesthesia shows the lowest cardiac index with the minimum changes in 30 minutes before and after delivery. As I mentioned, maternal cardiac output peaks immediately after delivery because of all transfusion. Epidural anesthesia increases the vascular capacity and may reduce payload. The study proved, proved that vagin vaginal delivery with epi epidural anesthesia could be the first preference for most cardiac patients. We also compared outcomes by the mothers of anesthesia for C-section. General anesthesia was performed in 47 C-sections for women with CHD, and neurochial anesthesia was in 214. General anesthesia was chosen in earlier times, and for women with more severe cardiac conditions, than neurochial anesthesia. Postpartum cardiovascular events, which occurred within one week after C-section, were found in 8% of neurochial and in 15% of general anesthesia group. After a statistical correction by severity of the disease, such as modified WHO plus, General anesthesia is not a risk factor of postpartum events after our oh, events. Sorry. Short summary cardiovascular complication rate in pregnancies with CHD is about 1 to 10 percent, but it's up to 100 percent in modified WHO class 4 patients. In the contrary, General population is less than 1%. There are times when complications are more likely to occur. Preterm delivery rate in pregnancy with CHD is 10 to 20%. In general population, it's ap approximately 5%. Vaginal delivery with epidural anesthesia can reduce cardiac load. I'm showing the same graph. As you see, postpartum is the time to be followed carefully as well as antepartum. Here is a pregnant case with pontan circulation. Her pregnancy was uneventful and delivered at 37 weeks gestation. Her BNP levels remained within normal limit pre and during pregnancy. Her echocardiographic results did not change and CTL returned pre-pregnancy value one month after delivery. Two weeks later, she emergently visited in a hospital and complained shortness of breath, edema, and body weight gain, three kilograms per two weeks. CTL became larger. The BNP level was significantly elevated around 300. Echocardiogram showed increased AV valve relaxation. Can anyone tell what caused her heart failure? 
there was only one different condition between one month after delivery and two weeks later. Until one month postpartum checkup, she stayed at her parents' home. Because she was fine at the checkup, she moved to her home. Do you know how useless Japanese husband is for nursing baby and housekeeping? How about in Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore? <laughs> and after this experience, I explained how important the family support after childbirth is at preconception counseling, especially to husband, okay? We investig investigated breastfeeding status and late postpartum cardiac events in 153 women with CHD. Interestingly, more severe cases tended to use mainly formula. Thus, the formula group had a higher rate of late postpartum cardiac events. In multivariate analysis showed only medication use was a significant predictor for the events. The next, I'm showing effect of pregnancy on long-term outcomes. This is a case of repaired TOF with severe PL. Her CTL became larger during pregnancy and did not recover or even become worse one year after delivery. Several studies have shown that pregnancy affects the right ventricle more than the left ventricle. This is a study to follow echo parameters in pregnancies with repaired TOF. Changes of left ventricle diameters are small and do not change before and after pregnancy. On the contrary, right ventricle diameters increase throughout pregnancy and also in postpartum. Here is a CML study for women with repaired TOF. Women with repaired TOF who had completed pregnancy appeared to experience an accelerated rate of right ventricular remodeling compared to the much non-pregnant group. This tendency was obvious in those with severely dilated RV at baseline. Here's another important information about postpartum follow-up, a famous phrase. Pregnancy is a stress test in a woman's life. Women with heart disease, complicated with peripartum cardiac events, tend to have another event within five years after delivery. This applies not only cardiac complications, but also an obstetrical complications in general population. Many studies suggest that infertility, HDP, GDM, preterm delivery, SGA, those factors predict future cardiovascular event. Therefore, women with CHD who have experienced peripartum complications should be more carefully followed up in postpartum and long term. My last topic is contraception. Oral contraceptives are widely used by women. However, as you know, combined hormonal contraceptives containing estrogen have thrombos thrombosis risk. It is not recommended to using women with the first and the second generation mechanical valves, ischemic heart disease, pulmonary hypertension, severely reduced left ventricular contraction, and arthritis. Are there good contraceptive methods which are safe and highly effective for women with CHD? Yes, we usually recommend intrauterine contraceptive device called Mirena IUS. We have, we have to be careful at its insertion about IE and vasovagal syncope. We reviewed 33 women with heart disease who use Mirena IUS. 
many of them took warfaring and complained about very long and uh, much volume of menstrual problems. Most of women declared their menstrual blood amount decreased after Mirena insertion. In the result, their mean hemoglobin levels were increased. Among women with increased hemoglobin levels tend to show decreasing BNP. IUS can be used safely among women with heart disease. And moreover, there is a possibility to improve their conditions via increasing hemoglobin levels. This is my last slide. Women with CHD still need close follow-up in postpartum. Pregnancy may affect long-term outcomes in some cases, such as cases with dilated right ventricle. Caution is needed in selecting contraceptives for women with CHD. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kamiya. It's always, your lecture is always nice. Thank in you. The, in the, the each, say, difficult cases, probably it's a very educational, education, uh, educational in, information for the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we like to, we like to move to the next speaker, uh, Joko Wan. I don't need a com introdu introduction, anything for the Joko Wan. You are too famous. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> So welcome. Uh, no, no, I I'm a visitor. You are you are in a Taipei uh, major uh, doctors. So the do you okay for the start your lecture for yeah, the yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. other congenital heart disease intervention? Okay. But uh, uh, your slide is a not presentation. Yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> Don't don't be rush. It's okay for the IU IU wait wait your the slide comes. So the intervention is a very so it, is it okay? You you see my uh not coming not, yet. Not yet. Okay, I I try. So the adult simple lesions is uh, probably a very good target for the catheter interventions. Also, probably he will talk about uh, new new developed for the say pulmonary valve in transcatheter pulmonary valve implantations. Maybe you okay. So now your presentation slide come to the. Screen. So, uh, Tej, do you see my slide? Yeah, I see you. I, I see oh, your slide. Okay. Why don't okay. you Why don't you click for that say slideshow? Okay. okay. So, uh, I would like to thank uh, the Wait. organizing committee and uh, Mei Huan Wu, who just rushed rush into my room and my and uh, help me to uh, the uh, the show the slides. <laughs> so uh, I would like to talk about catheter intervention in HCSD and the interventional procedure for HCSD. We may have ASD and PFO closure, most common, and VST closure, PDA closure, structural sign up for survival and closure, and also for stenotic lesion, PS, AS, barbiplasty, and coartation, aorta stenting and pulmonary valve replacement. <clears throat> and also cast coronary artery uh, fistula embolization. And uh, before we do the intervention, uh, we have to evaluate patient. How about the general condition, uh, functional class, heart failure, arrhythmia, any pacemaker, uh, com comorbidities such as CAD, hypertension, metabolic syndrome. And uh, this is our uh, surgeon, and this is me. And we visited Vietnam and uh, we 
because of caster intervention is, I in my mind, is less traumatic to the patient. So I think uh, for every congenital lesion defect, uh, catheter closure will be the first choice. If we fail, then we need the surgeon backup to re uh, replace our role in the treatment. And <clears throat> so I, I will try to uh, repair every lesion in, uh, in via interventional uh, procedure. And uh, <clears throat> X-ray, echo, CT, 3D, with 3D reconstruction is most common used tool. And also MRI to evaluate the, the valve and also pull valve regulation fraction. And also uh, we can use 3D reconstruction uh, to see the morphology of the pulmonary arteries. And the uh, uh, case recursion of that to right shunt lesion, ASD, VSPDA, Roger, Sina, Basaba. And ASD in adult is usually remain undiagnosed until adulthood. And because of subtle symptom in, age, in childhood, and uh, ASD is the most common CSD diagnosed uh, in adults and presenting with arrhythmia heart failure. And we have seen a lot of the case presented with uh, atrial uh, a flutter, arrhythmia, and uh, atrial fibrillation, and also heart failure like this patient. So if patient associate with atrial arrhythmia, should we uh, send them to the electrophysiology to evaluate first? And uh, if it's possible, abrasion, then cast closure. I think this will be better. But however, a uh, patient with permanent uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, the pulmonary vein isolation was not so effective in patient with ASD. And cast closure is another option if the uh, the the, the atrial uh, fibrillation is permanent. And uh, we have to look at the pulmonary artery pressure. We have to do some hemodynamic study. And sometimes I do pulmonary artery wedge angel and PVR, PVRI, and auto saturation, but then test occlusion is crucial before closing the defect. And this is a recommendation. Uh, PBR less than three with unit, then one is one B. PBR three to five unit with QPQS more than 1.5 is class two B, but we have to evaluate in the visual case. And if PBR more than five with unit, we started target therapy. If PBR less than five with a unit with a QBQS more than five and fenestrating uh, on the device can be used to close the, the defect. If PBR more than five unit, despite target therapy or the saturation on exercise, uh, this is contraindicated. This is a case with a large ASD in an adult and we usually use 3D images to, to help our, our procedure. And after that, we can close with a large uh, device, so maybe 40. And sometimes patients have multi fenestrated defect like this one. And these 3D images. And I put two occluders. There's another one, and so uh, so I use two devices. So for patient with pulmonary artery hypertension, and I think the TAGE has a lot of experience in treat and repair, but uh, I usually like to uh, partial repair and treat, uh, use a fenestrating device. And this is um, a diagram 
that uh, if PBR more than eight, maybe the the uh, case closure should be uh, should not be performed. And we do some fenestration like this. Usually I like to make uh, two fenestrations and one larger one and one smaller one to keep that, uh, to ensure that, that there's fenestration. And sometimes I stand the uh, fenestration several months later, like this one. And how the PFO closure is not uh, the so many in Taiwan. Uh, patient have uh, we usually uh, the uh, neuro neurologists refer the patient to us because of crystallogenic stroke, and we have to look at the heart where there is right to left shunt use echo contrast or bubble test, and device closure if there is history of stroke and the positive right to left shunt. And VSD in adults, uh, because VSD is most common defect in CSD, but still we can close the defect, uh, the VSD in Taiwan. Patient may have heart failure, coronary hypertension, LT valve prolapse, AR, and infected endocarditis. <coughs> In Taiwan, we are allowed to close the VSD if there is significant left to right shunt without severe pulmonary hypertension or LV dilatation or progression of LT valve, perhaps AR, or history of infected endocarditis. And we, we now have two type of device that uh, was covered by our insurers. One is CELA, a membranous VSD occluder. Another is uh, the we so called MFO, and the <coughs> muscular occluder are uh, also available for uh, close muscular type VSD. But the muscular type VSD is not so many in or in dental patients. Uh, this is a large VSD. You can see the shunt. In QPA case 2.1 and with a uh, mild pulmonary hypertension. And you can see the defect extend a little more to the LT valve. <coughs> and we use a setup device to close the defect. And and you can see that the and 3D also quite helpful. You can see the defect here. And after that, device is here. And this is 75 year old male with residual VSD after operation. And you can see the defect 0.9 and QPQS 1.6 and with my AR. So we close it with 12, 12 millimeter left tech symmetric device. And this is another one with 75, uh, 7.5 millimeter defect. And we close with a uh, uh, MFO. You can see that we open MFO in the Delta, then pull a little bit back to LV. Then finally, it's in good position. And the angel light is some small residual shunt. Okay. And the post with TTE. Okay. <clears throat> PTE in adults. Uh, also, there are some cases, uh, majority have symptoms, and you can see the calcified ductus and usually large. ADO1 is more common device used in close PDA. This is patient with a large, sorry, oh, did a moon at all, right, sorry. Ah. Uh, 
and we can this is another one with a large defect and we do the wage angel and there's uh, somehow had the pulmonary hypertension. Sorry, there's a problem. No, we can understand. Okay, but I, I, I think it's okay that uh, not, we have some cases with rupture sinus basava. I think this is more common in uh, Oriental people and uh, this rupture sinus basava into right atrium. Oh, did I move? So we use uh, 81 to close the defect. And you can see here. And coarctation of the aorta in adults, uh, there's also not so many comparing to the Western population. The indication is pressure gradient more than 20 millimeter and narrowing or narrowing on C, uh, senior MRI. And balloon dilatation is not so effective in adults. And also there's maybe some dissection. So stand will be more uh, effective and also safer, especially cover stand will be better if the narrow is severe. And long segment stenosis uh, or isthmus hypoplasia should be operated. Sorry, this is a case of coarctation stenting. And uh, finally, pulmonary valve replacement um, in patient, especially tetrafalot after operation, uh, moderate to severe PR may appear uh, uh, decades later, and uh, probable replacement is required in around thirty percent patients, and uh, because of transannular part of RVOT was usually placed in the in uh, in our country, and also I think also in Japan, and PR severe severity increase with age, and. So PR is not a benign lesion. And this is the indication for the pool valve replacement and right ventricle and diastolic volume index by MRI more than 150 per square meter or RV and systolic volume more than 75 to 80 milliliter per square meter and present significant pool regurgitation for PR index more than 30%, RV dysfunction, ejection fraction less than 40. So uh, maybe if we, there are three criteria, the, the, the device will be, uh, will be covered by our insurance. And currently we have PASLA valve and MEDI valve in Taiwan, and Venus P valve also uh, underwent the clinical trial. We have 15 case uh, experience and uh, the melody valve can uh, implant uh, in patient with RVOT less than 22 millimeter and pasta valve can be implanted in patient with a diameter less than 30. So the maximum size of pasta valve is 32. And now we use a lot of past part Pasta valve now because it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it, uh, the, the Swiss requirement is low. Maybe 18 or 20 French Swiss is enough and very easy. Uh, not really easy. It's, it's very convenient uh, to, to uh, deploy the valve. And we have to look at the, the types, the RBOT morphology. And the, this pyramidal type uh, is uh, very uh, difficult to treat and especially very challenging. And type two, uh, very straight type is, is easier and safer. And type three, maybe in only some selected patients. Type four uh, is like this 
is maybe many patients uh, have type 4 and type 5. Most patients can receive this kind of self-expandable valve. Sorry. And th this is a, a point regurgitation NGO. You can see the calcified RVOT because of the patch. And we have to do sizing to measure the uh, the 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 di narrowest diameter is twenty seven, and we have to test coronary artery compression. And uh, we deploy the valve in the uh, distal main pulmonary, then opening gradually, sorry, and finally the valve is was deployed. This is another case. And some patient has the palababadic after uh, uh, valve replacement. Uh, this is case with palababadic and uh, there's multi two, uh, two major leaks. So we use uh, the device from a uh, transepical approach because this patient has tried surgery before and we implant the first device, then the second device. So uh, this is my Capcom messages. Simple left to right shunt lesion without pump hypertension can be safely treated with transcastor technique in most patients, except other type VSD and premium type ASD. In patients with associated pulmonary hypertension, careful evaluation is crucial before castor closure. And uh, transcastor pulmonary valve replacement is uh, an alternative to surgery in many tetralis valve repair patients. And uh, we are very lucky that uh, uh, the, this valve is now uh, covered by our health insurance. So we, we can do a lot of patient and be careful. We have to have make good friends with surgeon. We always have surgeon standby and team approach is required. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Joko, thank you very much. And uh, the situation for the day, one is a very uh, big number is uh, H receptor defect. And yeah. uh, in adult case, the how do you say in my, the how patient transfer to your clinic from the adult cardiologist or the, the say in the physicians and the regular physicians to your hospital? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, because of the half of them, referred by our adult cardiologist mm. and half of them walk in. They, mm. can, uh, they can see me and <laughs> register at my clinic. And then, oh, I see. and also uh, our colleague, like uh, Dr. Lu and Professor Wu also refer mm. the adult patient to me. So mm. I think uh, we work as a team so we share all the cases. Mm -hmm. And the, some of the patient may have uh, some, say, left ventricular dysfunction, diastolic dysfunction. You may worry about the uh, closure for the ASD. So how do you indicate for that, in the, especially for such kind of, a, say, diastolic dysfunction of the left ventricle? That's a very difficult question to answer. Usually, we, uh, if there is diastolic dysfunction, uh, we can have some tests like a dopamine do test uh -huh. uh, infusion to, to see uh, where the, the, the cardiac function will be increased or sometimes we use LASIKs. Mm. And uh, if there, sometimes we see the hemodynamic, if there diastolic dysfunction, then LA pressure or LV and diastolic pressure will be elevated and balloon testing before closure. 
and usually in patient with significant diastolic dysfunction, I will fenestrate the device. Mm -hmm. Then it will be safer than make a big fenestration mm -hmm. instead of like a small fenestration. I see. How about you, Tej? Yeah, we do the, say, in the, initially we do the, say, the additional, additional heart failure management because most of the adult patient is a not completely heart failure management, just as say they have a less symptom. So we do the heart failure management at first, then yeah. think about the next step. Okay. So that is a very important. Also that arrhythmia management is also very important. Okay, yes. thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Joko. Okay. So we like to move for the Final speaker, Julie Tan. Julie, how are you? I'm good, thank you. <laughs> good, good to see all thank of you. you. Well, yeah, thank you for coming for the, say, in uh, this ACHD webinar. You will, the topics is, uh, say, very important for the transition for the pediatrics to adult or the, say, pediatric hospital to the adult hospital. Please start your lecture. Thank you very much. So thank you, Teji, uh, and uh, thanks to the um, uh, committee for the invitation. So my topic today is very different from everybody else. It's on transition and transfer of the patients to the adult congenital heart clinic. So I'm going to um, basically divide this talk into uh, in, an introduction on what is the transition clinic and why is there a need, and then on setting up this transition clinic and the challenges that need to be overcome. And also, uh, lastly, I will share our experience in Singapore and on our transition clinic, which we call the uh, Young Adult Congenital Heart Clinic. So what is transition clinic and why is there a need for transition? So essentially, the American Academy of Pediatric States goal of transition in healthcare is really, especially in healthcare of young adults with special healthcare needs, is really to maximize the lifelong functioning and potential. And this is through provision of high quality and then developmentally appropriate healthcare services that continue uninterrupted uh, as the individual moves from adolescence to adulthood. So you can imagine an adolescence is really at a crossroad, right? They have so many things to think about, what's the changes ahead, you know, they're a little bit confused, they're unsure, you know, they are in a, in a way a semi-identity crisis. Uh, they are looking very much to a new life, but they are also afraid of giving up their old life. So we must bear in mind as the adolescents develop, there are several developmental tasks that they usually have to overcome. So for example, adolescents have to, you know, consider socializing with peers, how to socialize correctly. They have to accept that their body is changing and accept the physical changes in your body. They have to start establishing social roles, what's gender identity. Uh, they are trying to be more independent. Uh, again, the relationship with their family maybe changes. And then at the same time, they are maybe establishing uh, intimate relationship with the opposite uh, gender. They think about the future job, what's the career. Then at the same time, their values, their ethics, you know, how they should behave, and, and what is socially responsible. So at, in essence, transition is really a passage from one life phase. So it's from one life phase of adolescence to another life phase of adulthood. When they do this uh, adjustment passage, there is at times a disconnectedness from the normal way of doing things. So when we said we provide transition to care, what it's, it's essentially a provision of interventions that caters to the medical, the psychosocial, the educational needs of the adolescents. What you want is you want them to move towards becoming independent and to be able to take charge of their lives. So the transition program is then a set of transitional care intervention that will help you to do this, right? And then you have a plan which says, okay, this is what you're going to do and uh, these are your goals and how you're going to achieve that. So transition is an essential passage of life and hopefully for a better outcome. So if we look at the 2021 ESC consensus statement on transition to adulthood, 
and transfer to adult care, you can see that the age, the transition age really starts somewhere between 14 and can go on to 20, right? So you should really start a couple of years before the transfer of care. And there should be a transition plan which involves some counseling and education. You look at the needs, at some stage, you may want to introduce the ACHD team and then provide some kind of guidance to the parents. So you can see somewhere between 14 and then roughly about 20, you should really transfer the care. And this is important because we know now that 90% of children are born with adult congenital heart disease are surviving to adulthood, but 26.1% experience some kind of interruption in this care. So why is there a need for transition in congenital heart disease? So we know that as patients get older, just as they change school from primary to secondary school, the healthcare needs of patients also need to change. In childhood, the emphasis is on correct diagnosis, on growth, on development, but the, in adulthood, the emphasis is different, right? The, most of the lesions are already corrected. So you look at the residue and the sequelae of the, the surgery, you look at the physical and emotional effects of living with uncorrected defects or palliated defects, you look at the effects on work, on exercise, and subsequently childbirth, and then you kind of anticipate what are the long-term complications. And not only that, as the patient gets older, there's also development of acquired cardiac and non-cardiac disease and the impact of the underlying congenital heart disease. American College of Cardiology says that transition process should really start at early adolescence. And in the ESC consensus statement, they say it probably should start somewhere pre-transition from the age of 14. Our optimal age of transfer is 18 to 19, but patient preference is actually earlier. So in real life, I think the transition process should be depending on the patient's developmental and medical condition and should be individualized. Not only that, you should look at uh, what is the society you know, development and what is the best age to transition uh, in, the, in your society and in your country. So in Singapore, uh, we run the adult program and our feeder, which is basically the KK Children's Hospital, we have a collaboration with this transition program. And most of our, all patients, in fact, are seen from the age of 16 onwards. But conversations about transition really starts from the age of 14 to 15 by the pediatric cardiologist to mentally prepare these patients for successful uninterrupted transition. Uh, this is important as most of these patients has been followed up since birth and early childhood. So there's always a strong attachment and loyalty to their pediatric cardiologists and the pediatric institution. So, so in the transition uh, process, we need to allow time for the patients to say goodbye to their pediatric cardiologists. And this can be a handshake, a nod, a hug or whatever, but they have to have proper avenue for them to say goodbye and then move on. So let's uh, carry on with the setting up of the transition clinic and what are the challenges to overcome. So I think essential knowledge for a successful transition clinic is, first of all, we must understand the patient. We must see the diagnosis and prognosis from the patient's perspective. Try to see the problem from the patient's side, right? And we should not have judgment or bias you know, ideas about the patient's own subjective experience because we are not them. So we have to evaluate what is the emotional behavior and maybe the social adjustment that they need to overcome. At the same time, we have to encourage them to take more active role. We have to look at what are their behavioral uh, patterns and modifications. You know, we should maybe advise them they should not smoke, talk a little bit about drugs, alcohol, and then to also understand what are their expect expectation on their future health and their life uh, expectancy. So we also have to understand at the same time, the parents and the family, what's the impact of the congenital heart uh, uh, problems on the parents, on the siblings. We have to look at the parent-child uh, relationship and dynamics. What is the anxiety on the, on the parent's side? Are they comfortable uh, for, the, for the patient to go into adult care model? Uh, and also what is the role uh, of the congenital heart disease in limiting the child's activity, 
or the adolescence activity, and then maybe some kind of advice on that. So at the bottom of all this, this slide is a busy slide, but all I wanted you to, to, to understand from this slide is this word patient empowerment. So we want to educate the patient, give them knowledge to empower them so they can make good judgment. That's just the gist of it, right? And then we must be cognizant that there are developmental tasks and issues that adolescents have to face. That is a little bit different from the normal adult patients. So the transition uh, clinic usually has a transition curriculum. And these are some of the topics that uh, we cover. Uh, of course, if you're setting up this program, you should decide on what are the topics that should be covered by your clinic. So essentially, we look at the medical problems first. What are the cardiac, the post-surgical and non-cardiac medical problems? We look a little bit at the background, whether there are behavioral issues. We look at if the patients are on medication and whether this going forward, these are the medication that we want them to continue. We look at dental care and whether the need for antibiotic prophylaxis. Exercise and sports are important because most adolescents are active. And in Singapore, uh, the uh, male patients have to go for enlistment at the age of 18. So we have to provide the um, report to the uh, SAF, the army, to say, you know, so they have some idea the patient can enlist and what is their past class. We have to see whether the patient is uh, going overseas for studies. We have to see their uh, traveling, whether they need oxygen. And then we have to talk about what are their future career plans, employment, what is suitable for them. At the same time, we have to advise them on diet, on alcohol, on vaccinations, you know, uh, on cholesterol, and these are the uh, issues, genetic, and on if they are female, on contraception, and on pregnancy. So it's very important, we must select the medical reports, what are the notes we want to take from the pediatric to the adult setting. And if you have uh, electronic transfer, how are you going to transfer those? And if you don't, then at least some paper transfer, but you're not going to take everything. You're only going to take the important ones, right? So in the clinic, we look at, again, all these issues that we have discussed. So what are the residual problem? Is there a need for further surgery? We need to engage this patient and start the discussion. And if they need further surgery, is this best done in the pediatric setting or should we transfer them to the adult setting and get it done there? Right, and, and we should tell them what are the signs and symptoms to look out for and make sure the patient really understand their anatomy, their physiology, and what kind of surgery they have done. There are also non-cardiac surgical issues we have to consider in some patients. Some of them may have orthopedic problems, make sure that their dental is good, we may need to refer them to see the dentist, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, exercise is very, very important. And I think many children are encouraged not to exercise, but this is slowly changing. And we need to educate the children and the parents why exercise is important. And then discussion should be focused on really what they cannot do because nobody likes to be told what they cannot do, but we should emphasize on what they can do and what activity we need to encourage. And there are many guidelines out there that can help us to tell us, for example, this 2020 ESC guidelines on sports, and what are the sports and activity that the patient can participate in? What about education and career? So um, in uh, Veltment actually reported that only 22% of, of patients actually could identify their diagnosis correctly. And 36% have a wrong understanding and wrong idea of their illness. So we need education, right? At the same time, we must also be aware that because of the early surgery, sometimes in neonates or early infancy, the patient may have adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes. They may sometimes have uh, hyperactivity, behavior issues, and et cetera. So we may need to give them career counseling as well, looking at their lesion and then, you know, encourage them to tell us what they want to do and maybe guide them along the way. And also there's a high rate of unemployment uh, in UK, we can see. And a lot of the time we also need to educate future employers why actually this patient should be given a job and why, they sh why there, is an, uh, there shouldn't be so much fear of, of congenital patients, even in complex congenital patients of getting the jobs that they want. And they will be 
uh, actually um, useful to society uh, and to society as a whole, and they should be able to contribute effectively. So patients with developmental delays and disability, this is another big group. So we uh, adult uh, cardiologists are usually not so good. So we should be familiar what are the syndromes, what does it imply, and how we should follow them up. So let me take you through to our young adult congenital clinic. But before that, uh, I would like to highlight this article uh, that is published uh, last year. And you can see that only 42% of 96 ACHE centers in Europe has a former transition program, although 88.5% has a structured transfer program. So if you look at across many countries in Europe, as you can see, transition, only 40 have, and uh, 56 of these centers do not have a transition program. And 38 have a transfer program, and nine has no transfer pro program. And you can see across an individual country, there's really a lot of variation. And you can see also uh, on the other table, transition and transfer the age, right? Some starts at 14 and then goes on to age 25. Uh, some still continue in center 23 to transfer patient up to age 35. So there is really a lot of variation uh, there. And I think despite some improvement there are, a lot of the programs lack an age and development based kind of approach. And if you look at quality indicators for transfer, having a structured transfer is one quality, transferring all patients, having some kind of overlap, a flexible transfer, and uh, the youth getting some detailed medical record and ACHD team receiving patients' complete medical history. So, and then the indication for transition, having a good program, having a transition specialist, education, some written protocol, flexible transition period. So these are all the uh, transfer factors, good factors and quality indicators. But if you look at this chart here, across all the centers in Europe, you can see, if you look at only four centers have a maximum of trans six uh, trans transition criteria. And uh, some, a lot of centers have uh, Trans six transfer criteria, but no transition criteria. So you can see there's a whole lot of mix and very, very few centers actually achieve maximum transition or transfer uh, quality indicators. So there are different, there are four models of transition uh, care. Uh, for us in Singapore, we have the uh, joint clinic model where the adult cardiologist visits the clinic at the pediatric center and then uh, have a clinic there and then transfer the care. There's also other uh, models such as introductory model where the pediatric cardiologist visits the ACHG clinic and then introduce the team. Uh, there is also the pediatrician in adult care model. There's also a transition coordinator model. This is usually run uh, by advanced practice nurse. So you have to decide in your center which is the model that you're going to go for. Now remember transition uh, is not transfer. So just having the patients transfer to adult center, that is not a transition program. So transition program need to have a pre-transition, start of transition, transfer, and then end of transition. So in our program, we, our aim is to prepare young adults for successful uninterrupted transition. We want to optimize potential and productivity. We want to improve quality of life and life expectancy. And we do this through education, through communication, through patient empowerment. And our emphasis is always more on the patient and less on the parents. So I'm going to go through the, the, the three pre-transition phase. Again, this starts at, at, uh, in Singapore about age 13 to 14. Uh, this is started by the pediatric cardiologist and involves the family and sometimes uh, this uh, role can also be fulfilled by advanced practice nurse. Then the patient goes into the transition phase where they actually see us in the transition clinic and we try to go through the transition checklist, what we must go through. And we need to again, educate them to thought them, to teach them to recognize the concerning symptoms and signs, to make sure that they understand what the therapy in the future involves and also how to navigate the adult healthcare setting. Then we transfer the patients. And usually we transfer at the age of 16, but sometimes if they are not mentally prepared, 
we can then defer up to the age of 20 and I, we, I can see them in the transition clinic a couple of times before transferring. And why at the age of 16 or 17 or 18 this is because of educational milestone. Most patients like to finish maybe their A-levels or IB and then some kind, somehow they think they are more like adult and they're ready for transfer to adult care. So adult care is a little bit different. It requires more personal autonomy and responsibility. And we have to see the patient is ready for this. And we try not to transfer during a medical crisis. Like for example, if they are pregnant or they're mentally ill, because it imposed really a tremendous psychological burden and a sense of abandonment. So remember that coordinated transfer is crucial. You need to make sure you have a kind of health summary of report, medication list, look at what are the issues, and then address any questions by the patients and their family before transfer. So for us, we, we do it once a month. On the last Friday of the month, over the years, we have transferred about 100 to 150 patients every year. Uh, the adult cardiologists like myself or my team members, there are four of us, but usually two of us will go and we will run the clinic with the pediatric cardiologist. And this is what the clinic looks like. Usually I'm quite happy going there because it's really different from the adult clinics. It's very bright. There's lots of interesting murals, insects and flowers, and it's really quite different from the adult clinic. And we make sure that we are uh, friendly and uh, to everybody there, including the reception counters because they help us in the clinic. Uh, and uh, I usually bring a stethoscope and uh, a kind of field guide. So with a nice diagram, so I can do the education. And then I explain the diagnosis and make sure that they are comfortable. Uh, and if they are so, then we tell them when are they going to transfer. And then we make sure we get all the important notes. And if there's electronic transfer, then to, uh, that, that will be the best. Uh, and then usually about five o'clock we'll finish. And this is myself with the pediatric cardiologist uh, and the whole list of uh, patients, we will take them over. And usually out of 25 patients, about 20 to 22 uh, will show up and about 80 to 90% will be ready for transfer. Some may have residual problems. We need to rediscuss. And then we can decide if the investigation such as CT or MRI is best done in the pediatric center or the adult center. And I think some patients need more time. So in conclusion, many children born with congenital heart disease are surviving to adulthood and need to be transferred from pediatric to adult care. And transfer is not transition. You need a st structured transition program with clear aim and a curriculum to help you in this process. Setting up a transition clinic requires close collaboration between pediatric and adult healthcare providers. So there must be a common agreement as to the timing, the preparation, the program, and then it has to be a coordinated process. And I think nurses are essential as transition coordinators and they can play an important role too as educators. I think a good transition program will help to ensure that young patients with chronic disease such as congenital heart disease are well looked after for the rest of their lives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jolene. Uh... Uh, I think to say this kind of the program is very important for the continuous medical management for the young patient to the adult clinic. And uh, the, the, on the other side, it's already many patients already grown up and some of them were, may drop out of the follow-up. So now we are trying to something like a promotion about uh, bring, back, bring them back to the clinic for the, that is, a, of course, that must be a that, uh, clinic. That kind of promotion we are thinking in Japan. How do you think about the patient already drop out for the follow-up? Yeah, okay. Th thank you for the question. And this is very difficult. So, so normally when patients get transferred, so I have a whole, whole list of patients' names. So they are given an appointment and if they don't come, I will get my nurse to call them once. Uh, and then if you still don't come, we, we can call them two times. And then if you, if you do that, I mean, you cannot force them to, to come, you know, then if they really don't, and if they have complex congenital, then the one, of the, one of the physicians will try to call them. But if they still don't want to come, I think you've done your best. You know, I, 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 you have a program to try 
uh, to ensure that. But I think if you have a pre-transition and you educate the patient and their family right at the beginning, they are more likely not to drop out of the program because they understand the importance of why they need to come to you because you would tell them that this is not the end of it. These are the various problems that can happen uh, in adulthood and that's why you need to come because we need to ensure that these problems are dealt with because, before they become severe. So having a pre-transition program, a, a kind of really repeated education, maybe from the age of 14, 15, 16, you know, until it's in their head, and then they will not, they will want to come. But the, the later, the, the, the ones that didn't come, that one is very difficult. So I think mm. only say start from here and move forward. Yeah, the, the mostly, mostly, for example, like I say, patient had a tetralogy fellow, they already age 40 years old. That kind of, if the, if the condition is stable, that patient is lost of the follower. So that is a, our big issue for the, how do they, how do they come bring back to the hospital? That is our yeah. current issue for the adult congenital heart is already lost up adult patients. So, so the other thing you can do is uh, you can educate your um, adult cardiologist mm. uh, because at some stage, uh, let's say an old tetralogy at 40 years old, they would have at some stage come with arrhythmias. Then they may present to the adult cardiologist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or, or, you know, the, the adult, or they have, or they have coronary artery disease. I see that in a couple of my congenital patients now like tetralogy because they smoke and they are you know, they have diabetes and they have coronary artery disease, then they will pop up in the adult cardiologist. And then you must tell your adult colleagues, you know, please, if you have any congenital patients, besides sorting out the adult problems, please also send them back to us. So I think that kind of um, uh, um, uh, dialogue can, can also help you to get some of the patients back. Yeah. Okay, Julie, thank you. So the, how about the, uh, the other, other, uh, lecturers today, do, don't they want to some more comment or some more talk, additional uh, talk uh, at this point? Dr. Kamiya, Dr. Kamiya, yeah. how about say, you were uh, say, announcing about, the, how do we talk about as a young patient about uh, that their say daily the pregnancy or delivery in the in your say before before pre, pre, pregnancy counseling. Yeah, right now at the NCBC where I'm working, um, many of ACHD pay women um, are introduced to my preconception counseling mm -hmm. outpatient clinic. Um, but the most of them are over aged 20 years mm -hmm. old. So I'm not going to you know, do the preconception counseling for teenagers yet. And I think for teenagers, maybe before the transition, um, I think it's better for pediatric cardiologist or specialized nurse um, to give some information about the uh, pregnancy risk to the uh, HHD pa uh, CHD patient. Okay. I think. Okay. Thank you very much. So, Julie, do you have a, how about your clinic? It's a say, of course, they say anatomy is a very important info, say, education for the patients, for the women's patient pregnancy or delivery, that is a big issue. How do you think about that? Yeah, uh, thank you. It's, it's a pretty kind of sensitive um, uh, topic. Uh, usually if they are teenager, I see them 16 or 17 years old. Uh, if, if they come with their parents, then I mentioned a little bit about pregnancy in the future, you know, what are their risks, that kind of thing. Uh, and then I will kind of look at the parent and the, the relationship. Now, um, because if you tell them about contraception at this age, right, some of the parents will, you know, the eyes will open and look at me because they think that the children is not ready. Uh, but saying that sometimes uh, we have had a few teenage pregnancy because this topic was not um, uh, discussed at all. Yeah. 
So, so sometimes I would say, you know, if they come on their own, it's easier. Uh, if they come on their own and, and, you know, I ask them, okay, you're in college or whatever. Sometimes I ask them, do you have boyfriends? And do you want to ask me anything? And then, you know, you sometimes cannot do this on the first visit because they are not comfortable with you. So you, you may have to do it with a few more visits uh, when they've seen you a couple of times and they're ready to open up. And then uh, it would be good if you have some kind of leaflet on contraception uh, because you can give it to them and say, hey, you know, maybe there's some information on contraception and give it to you. You can read about it. If there's any question, maybe you can you know, talk to my nurse and things like that. So, so give them opportunities to ask again. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, I think just be very careful when they have both parents and the parents are not comfortable because the next thing you want is the, the parents telling the pediatric cardiologist, I don't, I don't like this adult cardiologist. I think my children's not ready uh, to transfer. You know, I think they need a few more years. So we've had this. So I think we have to be very, very mindful. Yeah, that is a important for to say. It, also doctors involved that this adult congenital heart disease in the adult cardiology has to be trained about the, say that kind of say the importance and the usually first few outpatient clinic take a very say have a very important period for the com good communication with each other so that is a, that process say recognize recognition is very important it, that is a, especially for the the adult cardiologist the next the next tra after the transition thank you julie thank you so i like to i like to using this short time i like to introduce for the this friday's topics we, our uh, Japanese Society of the Adult Congenital Heart uh, Disease that we are promoting about the uh, Asian Pacific Society for the ACHD Night. And uh, this Friday, we have uh, topics about the pulmonary artery hypertension of ACHD in Asia. So in Japan time is at uh, 9 p.m. So the jury, you are, uh, what time? 5 p.m. in the Singapore uh, time? I think six. Six, six I think. Six, six o'clock. <laughs> yeah, six o'clock. Okay. So, so we have uh, five very important speakers uh, this Friday. So please join our, our webinar. And this is a only one hour uh, program, but uh, probably it's a very exciting topics. So uh, thank you very much for the every one uh, that if you have uh, no, no any more the comment, I'd like to close this uh, program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.